Every year, the U.S. military budget grows larger and larger. But a new piece of legislation would decrease U.S. military spending if passed. The People Over Pentagon Act would cut the Department of Defense budget by $100 billion and reinvest the money in non-military federal programs. The bill was introduced by Representatives Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan, the co-chairs of the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus. Policy analyst and advocate Stephen Semler is here to tell us more. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So, yeah, tell us tell us more about this. What is what is your understanding here? Well, the bill is based on recommendations, or not recommendations, but policy proposals or options laid out by the Congressional Budget Office um, in October 2021 that outlined basically three different ways that the U.S. could reduce military spending by one trillion over 10 years. So this bill takes instruction from that. Um, and when the report was released, I was sort of wondering what shape legislation would take uh, based on the proposal or based on uh, the CBO report. Um, and here it is, the People Over Pentagon Act. But the crucial thing to remember is that um, because it's a conversion amendment, meaning that it advocates shifting funds from a bloated military budget to um, atrophied social programs, two things would have had to go wrong during the Biden administration during fiscal year, uh, uh, his 2023 request, meaning that military spending was too high and social spending was too low in the view of these progressives. So it was a sort of canary in a coal mine. I called it an indictment of, of Biden's uh, not just military budget, but uh, spending priorities as a whole in the article. What did we? What does the vote count look like for this? Do we have even a majority of Democrats on board? And if so, what's the likelihood that people are going to cross the aisle and support? There is this appetite, it, it does seem, on the right right now for kind of a, an anti-interventionism. Right. I'm not sure if the language um, advocating for converting uh, the funds to social programs will attract many Republicans. This is mm. the problem with... Um, Biden's social spending policies, if Biden had delivered fully on his campaign promises um, and Build Back Better passed, um, he didn't cut the infrastructure bill down by 75 percent, might be having a different conversation here where the bill would just say, um, we're just looking for an outright cut to reduce the U.S. military's overseas footprint and handouts to weapons contractors. But because of Biden's failures, I think congressional progressives were pressured um, to basically say, OK, well, if we're not going to get the money from from the White House, then we're going to have to take it from his military budget. So right now, I, I can't imagine that there's more than 20 co-sponsors to the bill, um, and it will be extremely difficult to even getting a vote on this thing. What do you make of the kind of ideological evolution going on in the two parties? You know, we're coming out of the an environment, the 90s, the aughts, et cetera, the, the Bush era Republican Party, uh, and really both parties being, you know, robustly pro-military, pro-foreign policy interventionism, pro-nation building, uh, tremendous bipartisan buy-in to that concept, with, you know, the Republicans being even more full-throated, but then uh, 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 eight year Democratic administration uh, disappointing many progressives on that front. And now, you know, with Ukraine, it's almost like the only opposition we're seeing from uh, Congress at all is actually coming from not most of the Republicans, but a, a small number of, of Republicans. And sort of anti-interventionism is again becoming more associated, I think, in some ways with the Republican Party than with, uh, with the Democratic Party. Now, as you said, what this means for this bill is different because, you know, taking military spending and then converting it into uh, into welfare spending or anything like that is not exactly what uh, what Republicans have in mind. But, you know, what do you make of this kind of ideological evolution more generally? I'd say it's needed and we have to rely on it, or at least anti anti-war people and anti uh, imperialists. We have to rely on bipartisan support now, especially as you brought up the you know, recent $40 billion Ukraine aid bill. There's little oversight in the bill. Um, they pressed it to pass it urgently or like within days. Uh, but a lot of the equipment that it buys uh, has a 24 to 36 month setup and readying time. Um, so, and especially after the COVID funding was stripped um, from the Ukraine bill, they're supposed to be passed uh, together. They were originally tethered together, but Biden ordered the House to strip away the COVID funding to urgent to pass more quickly this Ukraine aid bill. Um, I was expecting Democrats just to vote against it on the basis of that alone. 
uh, now that it was just nakedly just a, um, a military aid bill uh, that supports a strategy with no end in sight uh, other than conflict escalation. Um, so we need to rely on the, the Republicans who bothered to show up and actually protest the vote. Um, and the discourse that they had, that, they, that their reasoning for, for opposing the bill, the amendment, uh, was, was, I think, solid. Um, and I think something that should be adopted more widely throughout Congress. And we can't let uh, partisan disputes really get in the way. I'm worried that this war has become more and more part of the Biden administration's identity and the Democratic Party's identity building off of uh, Russia's scare tactics beginning in you know, circa 2016. Stephen, I wanted to ask you, because you do follow this more closely, and sometimes this conversation gets had in, 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 in vague ways, but as someone who is really looking at both the trajectory of military spending and the attitudes around it, there has been some, there have been divisions on the left where some folks think that leftists who would give credit to a certain strain of anti-interventionism on the right are giving too much credit, saying that it's largely superficial um, and inconsistent, and that when leftists say things like, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is getting to the left of squad members on some of these issues with, re regarding military spending, they're giving Marjorie Taylor Greene or people like that uh, too much credit. How do you see that debate? And, you know, do you think there is a role in pressuring Democratic politicians by talking about the growing appetite for um, lowering war spend, defense spending among Republicans? I think as advocates, as activists, as general public, when we have a bill that does something bad or a bill that does something good, um, our goal is to win votes, not necessarily to win people over. Um, so I, I don't really have too much concern of about uh you know pointing to republicans who you know who i otherwise disagree with um if they're right for the thing that we're fighting for then then so be it that's fine um i don't really see much value uh in the people themselves i i feel i feel good about the arguments that they have made um in the past about ukraine or the concerns that they brought up or at least uh, a, a chunk of them um and it's important to you know get the Democrats head on straight, you know, regarding this, because okay. they're right now, um, so far in 2023, they are the party of war. Both parties are, but they're they're really, you know, leaning that way and that they haven't really protested, um, again, a strategy in Ukraine that comes down to arms dumping. And I say that seriously, and not just cynically, um, there really just is a disengagement um, from the Biden administration about pursuing diplomatic outcomes. Um, and, you know, they're saying, oh, we'll just leave it up to Ukrainians. It's like, that's a tough thing to just sort of, it's a cop out basically, because we're providing, you know, tens of billions in equipment and we have our finger on the trigger of, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of sanctions. So we have to be part of this discussion. Um, and if we wanted to move the conflict closer to a resolution, we, we definitely have the power to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. A, a point taken, you know, it's, it's something I've experienced with uh, progressive Democrats, like, so, uh, democratic socialist, democrat, people I disagree with on everything, but then are the people I invariably agree with most or identify with most on foreign policy. And you know, it's the same with and then Republicans, the ones you know to, that you're told are are totally the most crazy of all, are, are invariably the ones who are who I agree with on these policies or who are uh, the only ones sounding the alarm about uh, about some of this stuff. So you, you, the bipartisan consensus in the kind of middle place, which I might agree with on other issues, it's not always right. It's certainly been not right from you know from my perspective from our perspective on uh, on foreign policy so Stephen, thank you so much uh, for joining us my pleasure and thanks for the good questions and we'll have more rising right after this stay with us <laughs> 